Okay, my name is Ron Carrico, and I'm a docent here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. And today is February the 13th, 2019. 19. And today I'm with Charles Penny the third, also known as Cat Penny. And he was a, a marine aviator. He started off in the, uh, went to the Naval Academy studied engineering, graduated in 64, was on active duty for quite a period of time, and he flew uh, of quite a few different fighters. And we're going to talk about uh, his experience as a fighter pilot and as an airline pilot. And I think we can, he was also a lawyer afterwards, and I don't think we're going to talk about that at all. Because we just... So, where were you born? I was born in Los Angeles, 1942. 40 what? 42. 42. I'm older than you are. <laughs> How about that? What, uh, what did your parents do? Well, my father uh, was in World War II as the uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers in Chicago. And uh, then after the war, he uh, became the proprietor of a um, Dodge and Plymouth agency in El Centro. And uh, he did that for uh, five, five, six years, and then he decided he'd go back to law school. So he packed up the family, or four boys in my family, and uh, we went to Stanford and uh, went with Dad to law school, and then we uh, came back to El Centro where he set up his practice, and that's where I graduated from high school. So how did you happen to go to the uh, Naval Academy? <clears throat> well, I was considering uh, several schools on the West Coast, and um, an uncle of mine suggested the Naval Academy, and that sounded like... Um, an interesting uh, concept, so I applied, and uh, I got an appointment from the local representative, and uh, entered the Naval Academy in 1960. And graduated in '64. Then you were selected for or you selected pilot training thereafter. Yes, uh, in the graduating class in about February, you uh, um, go in and tell everybody what you want to do. And so first I uh, wanted to be a Marine, and second I wanted to fly. So they uh, uh, gave me a, a tentative assignment that uh, I would go to flight school after attending the basic school at Quantico, Virginia. Why did you want to become a Marine? Uh, I'd had four years of the Navy as a, a big bureaucracy, and I wanted to be a, a, a fighter. Wow. Well, now we have, we have the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. And at that time, you were flying the same airplanes as the, the, Navy, the Marines are flying the same airplanes as the Navy. But there's a substantially different role between the three services and their use of airplanes. What is the basic concept of using a mil, a Marine aviation? Well. Um, aviation uh, <clears throat> is one of the supporting arms of the Marine infantrymen, and so uh, our mission primarily was close air support with uh, our Marines, although we did uh, do some deep strikes in Vietnam. A deep strike being? Uh, well, we uh, supported the A-6s on the, their uh, missions in, in and around Hanoi, and uh, we uh, attacked some of the installations in the southern uh, portion of North Vietnam around uh, uh, Vinh. Go to pilot training? Uh, Pensacola, Florida. Okay. 1965, uh, about January, I checked in and I graduated from flight training in June of 66 in uh, Beeville, Texas. Oh wow, so we were exactly at the same time. I went in January 65 and graduated in May 66. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your first assignment, first aircraft assignment was? First aircraft assignment was uh, the second Marine Air Wing in Cherry Point, North Carolina, uh, where I uh, went into the uh, group um, commanding officer and uh, said that I wanted to fly F-4s. And uh, he said, uh, well, we've got a, we need some pilots here to fly A-4s right now. I said, Colonel, you don't understand, I'm a fighter pilot. And it took me about 45 minutes to convince him that uh, he really needed to send me to F-4s. And uh, 
so I was finally successful. Well, but explain the term to me. I, I don't quite understand when you said fighter pilot because the A-4 is an attack aircraft. Correct. Typically called an attack aircraft, A standing for attack, F standing for fighter, and usually the Navy at least, when they think of fighters, they think in air to air, protect the fleet. Yes. So, so you were using... So the, the Marine Corps' uh, designation is VMFA, which V is, stands for heavier than air, F is for fighter, uh, M is for Marine, a, F is for fighter, and A is attack. So the F-4 that the Marines used were both fighter and attack. Okay. But I mean, were, I don't even, I can't even recall, do the Marines ever actually get into air-to-air -air combat in Vietnam? Uh, yes, um, we um, we had some Marines uh, pilots who uh, were on um, um, missions with the Air Force, but uh, we had air-to-air uh, -air missiles on board to, to protect the uh, A-6s as they were going north. So we. I'm not aware of any air-to-air uh, -air engagement by the Marine F-4s in Vietnam. But, what, but in your typical armament load, though, on the F-4s, did you carry sparrows or sidewinders just in case? Yes. Well, so you did? Yes. It's probably sidewinders, not sparrows so much. Not so much, right. Yeah. The sparrow being uh, radar-guided for longer distances and probably too far away to never see anything anyway. Exactly. Well, I, by that I mean you have to identify the target before you shoot at it. And, and Sparrow is more up close and personal. So, yeah. Hmm. yeah so, well, that's interesting. But most of what you did, though, was actually the attack mold more than anything else. We dropped more bombs than the uh, attack uh, squadrons in uh, July in 1971. And uh, we were the uh, fighter squadron of the year. Oh, wow. So when did you? So where did you actually train for the F-4 though? Cherry Point, North Carolina. And those were B models or J? Those were Bs, B. F-4Bs. Okay, I know a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then how long was the training program? Well, at Cherry Point, uh, I checked in in June, and by January. I was on my way to Vietnam, so that was six months. About the same for the Air Force. Except, you know, I was initially, we were in the, we started off at the back seat. Although you must have had a, a tandem airplane of some sort. Did they have a C model they flew around to originally get checked out in it? No. Uh, my first flight uh, was with a, a senior uh, radar intercept officer in the back seat, and um, we, uh, took off and uh, during the course of this familiarization flight um, the oil pressure went to zero on the left engine and so we shut that down and came back and landed and the operations officer wanted to know why I didn't declare an emergency and the reason was because the F-4 flew better on one engine than any of the airplanes I'd flown in the training command. <laughs> <laughs> what did you fly in the training command? I flew a, uh, the F-9, the F-11, T-2, Buckeye, and the um, T-34, Mentor. Okay. Then the, you know, the T-2 was, that's an Air Force T-33, wasn't it? Uh, well, it was similar to it. It was a straight wing with pontoons on the yeah, wingtips. Yeah. White and orange, as I recall. Right. So. But now the so the first flight in the F four man you let the burners off that must have just got your attention. It was time. a kick in the pants. But uh, I had previously flown the F eleven, which was the first afterburner airplane oh, really? in the training command. So in your initial hop before the engine failed, what did you do on your first your first flight in the F four? We went out and uh, and flew cross country and got familiar with the airplane and then came back and. Uh, practice landing. Okay. Yeah, our initial first flight was a Mach 2, you know, Mach 2.4 in my case, wow. to 60,000 feet, and back down again. That's great. It was just to show you what it would do, and 
And then after that, it was mostly just radar type stuff and deciding how to figure out the radar. The only time that I got to fly a clean F-4 was um, uh, when I came back from Vietnam and <clears throat> we, uh, we had some uh, airplanes on the flight line at El Toro. And so I took one of those up and uh, we flew Mach 2 uh, out over the west coast. And uh, that's the only time I ever flew Mach 2. Yeah, we flew, we flew quite a bit clean, you know, for air combat training. And the you know the acceleration was just unbelievable. I mean, I right. I had a Corvette over in I was stationed in Germany. I had a Corvette, and Highway 327 was right next to the runway. You know, one of those old Hitler highways. You know, and one one day I was leaving the base, and I I went out, and there was two F4s clean sitting there, you know, running up. And I thought, well, let me see what happens in a drag race here. I just, so I stopped my car, put it in first gear, and I. Uh, and I can see them run up the engines, you know, one mm -hmm. at a time, and then I can see the brake. I said, well, I'll just kind of feather the throttle until such time as they get rolling. Well, right away, that was a mistake. I mean, it's, you know, I was on the gas immediately. And by the time I got to second gear, they were gone. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, you know, when you're in the airplane, it never felt like that kind of acceleration. And I remember I went to the back seat one time, and, you know, when you're doing air combat up in northern New Mexico. And pulling across the top and things shuddering and vibrating, well, you know what I'm talking about. Sure. Dumping the nose and letting it burn. They went to Mach 1.6 in about six seconds. It was incredible. You know, just, well, yeah. Watching the ground come up like shit. Part of the uh, <clears throat> uh, flying the clean Phantom for the first time, um, uh, and the acceleration was so great. Uh, I had an early morning flight, and um, we were light loaded. And so we let the afterburner run down the runway at El Toro, and I did an Immelman on takeoff. And uh, that was a pretty exciting uh, flight for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of my, because I flew the T-38 in pilot training, and it, it, it was you know, an incredible airplane too. Mm -hmm. What I remember was we had to wait for the sun to come up and before we could take off. So I, was, I think I was number three or number four on a solo flight, and just asked for a, a burner climb and a left-hand turnout. And you know, I just left it in burner, and, and I went out, and I was I made the turn around. It was like parallel with the tower, ten thousand feet, just right. climbing like a rocket. You know, <laughs> whoa, God, that was fun. So yeah. now you guys didn't have a gun on the airplane, so we had a gun pod that we could put on the center line, but uh, it was not very effective. The Vulcan, you had the like, yes, the same one, yeah. Did you hear the story about the first time they ever tried that? What happened? No. They left the landing gear down and shut it off. <laughs> this is a test. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, it's like when they tried to test the, uh, the, the windshield and the, see if it's, with the chickens. Yeah, but they used a frozen chicken. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so when you flew the F-9, that was in pilot training then? Pilot training okay. at Beeville, Texas, yes. That and was advanced. Um, pilot, uh, advanced jet training. Which would be gunnery school and all that. Yes. So did they step, so since you're going to fly the Marines though, did they pretty much concentrate on air to ground as opposed to air to air? Well, in the pilot training, it was all Navy and Marine Corps together. Right. Um, we didn't do much, we didn't do any air to ground as I recall. Um, well, we did some air-to-air -air, uh, gunnery. Um, <clears throat> how'd, they, what, how'd they do the air-to-air -air gunnery? Uh, we'd launch out of Pensacola <clears throat> and um, fly out of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, we had a banner, a, a tow plane with a banner. And we'd have four people in the racetrack pattern uh, coming down and shooting the banner. What was towing the banner? I believe it was a TA-4, two-seat A-4. Yeah, the Air Force used a dart, you know, silver dart that you could actually lock onto, but, but then you could count the colored holes and, you know, I'm sure that the banner is the same with that one, right? right? we would count the colors. Yeah. I wonder if they still do that. I'm sure they do. I think so. Except now everything is so automatically. Probably do it from sitting someplace up in Las Vegas and flying the thing. <laughs> did you ever go back to, did, you've been to reunions for pilot training at all? 
not with pilot training, but uh, occasionally we'll have an F-4 reunion. Right. The, what kind of, so now, the, in the air to ground, what kind of air, air to ground would you do? A typical mission, what would that be? Typical mission uh, in uh, Vietnam in 1967. Uh, Let's talk about training. training Just first. training? Yeah. Um, you would have these um, uh, small blue bombs with the uh, white phosphorus in the tip, and uh, you'd uh, practice uh, generally 30 degree dive bomb maneuvers. 30? Hmm. Hmm. Not skip bomb? Uh, not very much. Really? We did skip bomb, strafe, and uh, 45 degree dive. Rarely did 30 degree. We did 60 a little bit, and that's scared the heck out right. of me at least. And what did your backseater do? He would call the altitude, the airspeed, and mark. Mark. And on mark, you'd pickle and pull out. Yeah, we always said pickle and pull out. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the drop altitudes? Oh, they were generally around 3,000 feet or 2,500, somewhere in there. Okay, you train, and now when do you go to Vietnam? 1971, January, uh, no, excuse me, 1967 was my first tour. January to March of 68. So a whole year? 13 months. Oh, wow. How many missions? The first tour, I flew 300 missions. Uh, but pretty much in the south all the time? Pretty much. The majority of them were in the south, uh, close air support, dropping uh, either snake eye bombs or napalm um, in close support. So when you're as flight one, two, four? Generally, it was two. Um, if we had a big strike or a, a big target going, we'd, we'd fly four. Where did you fly out of? Chu Lai, the first uh, go around, just south of Da Nang. So was there, did you coordinate with the Navy? Or was it just all with the Marines? It was all the Marines. All the Marines. And then their own forward facts and stuff like that? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we had both Marine forward air controllers and Air Force. Air Force flying the O2 and uh, even an O1. Yeah. One of the uh, memorable hops that uh, I had was a, a two two ship. <clears throat> we got called off the hot pad, and uh, we uh, flew up north to the DMZ. And uh, the forward air controller had this window open, and so. His voice was shaking, but that was a result of the airflow around his airplane rather than him shaking. But uh, he launched a, a rocket, a guiding rocket, into his tree line. And uh, we were north of the DMZ, and we shouldn't have been uh, flying low level, but all we had were snake eye bombs and napalm. And so we rolled in, and we dropped at low level, and uh, we got out of there. and. Uh, the uh, base at Kantian, the artillery base, did not receive any incoming for three days. So that was a very successful hop. Oh, wow. But all uh, due to this Air Force uh, pilot in an 01 wow. flying north of the DMZ. So, so most of the missions are two ship, which I thought that was interesting to use that term. Well, that's an Air Force term I think you'd be familiar with. Well, yeah, but if the Navy, you say that to the Navy guys and they go, oh, no, it's too plain. <laughs> right. Well, so you, I, you heard the other day that you made some carrier landings. Yes, that was in a training command. Uh, and then also uh, as part of my... Um, uh, shipboard training with from uh, VX-5, Air Tested Evaluation Squadron 5. Uh, we Where is that? had a recall. That's in China Lake, California. Is that how you know Jim? I, I didn't meet Jim uh, up there. I met him uh, later on when he was uh, uh, down here in San Diego. I think he was commuting back and forth. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about comparisons of airplanes. Now, how much did you fly the A-4? 
Uh, I got about 1,200 hours in the A4. Oh, wow. And how do you compare just by how much you like it, F4 versus A4? Well, there's no doubt uh, I enjoyed the, uh, the F4 as a fighter more than I did the A4. Why? <clears throat> it was bigger, faster, more capable. But all the guys that flew the A4 love it. I mean, you hear the guys going on and on about the A4. Well, um, I enjoyed flying anything I could get my hands on. Yeah. What did you... Now, the... It's Bob Arnold. He did a lot. I think they were called Iron Hand missions. And he was a, like, like the first guy in with the A-4 with the jamming equipment and hopefully they could pull up some missiles being fired at him so they could then strike the missiles. Did you guys have that kind of mission at all with the, with the Marines? No, we did not. So mainly Marines is just basically to for protect the, work with the guys on the ground. Exactly. Um, well, their support was our bread and butter. Did you ever get into situations where there were missiles involved, SAM missiles? Uh, got some uh, SAM missile warnings, but uh, never had to dodge an SA-2. What was the evasive, so if you had been engaged by a SAM, what was the evasive maneuver? Well, you put it at 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock, and then uh, you would pull G's and, and to outmaneuver the uh, missile. So you saw the smoke coming up, you turn to put it off of one wing or the other. And pull hard. Just as soon as you see it, start pulling hard. Sure. What, were your, what was the F-4 limited to? Oh, uh, the G limits? Um, Probably uh, four and a half G's positive, a negative uh, one and a half, something so, like that. Uh, ours was eight. We used 8.3 mm -hmm. down on the deck, you know. Which, of course, that's where the F4 was the best. It wasn't very good up high, right. honestly. That surprises a lot of people. I thought, do you know Edward uh, Cassidy by any chance? Yes. You do? You know him? Yes. Yeah, sure. He sat right there and I interviewed him a couple of years ago. Tom Cassidy was probably the best fighter pilot the Navy had during his time. He flew over 100 different fighters. And uh, some of them highly classified. Yeah, I couldn't get him to talk about it. Yeah. And then about six months later, I found a book about the whole Russian squadron business, you know, with the uh, uh, MiG 23s and 21s. And no matter what airplane he flew, he won. <laughs> well, he was also a viper. Yeah, how do you know him? Uh, I knew him. Uh, I met him when I was at VX-5. Uh, he was at VX-4 yeah, right. and uh, Point Magoo. And uh, he came down uh, at one time, gave a talk, and uh, I kind of followed him from then on. Yeah, he was really interesting. Yes. He flew a Harrier without any training particularly. I wasn't aware of that, but I said, that's dangerous. You, I said, how did you do that? He said, well, I flew a bunch of helicopters, I read the manual, and, but the funniest thing, I said, well, how did you ever manage to fly all these different airplanes, like the X-22 and things like that? He said, well, I guess I always brought them back. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an understatement, isn't it? <laughs> he was very good. Yeah, and then he, he was the guy that principally developed the Predator, too. Yes, uh, working for General Atomic. Yeah. I said, how'd you pick up the name? He said, I had all these names written on a whiteboard. I was just, he said, I got to come up with a name. And he finally just went, that one, Predator. Yeah. Kind of cool. So you like the a F4 better than the A4? Now, well, if I had my choice, sure. I'd like to go supersonic. The A4 was not, was limited in that regard. Did you ever get close to it? Close to what? Supersonic. With? The A4. The A4. Um, don't lose, don't, did you try, and if you did, what happened? No, uh, the fastest I ever went uh, in an A4 was at an air show <coughs> in uh, Palmdale. And uh, once you start getting close to the, uh, to the Mach 1, the uh, airflow is interrupted over the tail, and it makes it a little hard to control um, vertically. And so once I got close to that, I uh, backed off and I never tried it again. Yeah. 
You, you know John Farron, right? I, I don't know John. Well, he's one of the docents, but he's also on the board. But anyway, he, he uh, we talked about the A4. He had, a, I think he had two combat tours in the A4s. And he said he tried to make it go supersonic or miles, and they said it just kept tucking under. Right. Yeah, just couldn't, just couldn't do it. Doesn't have a flying tail. So what are you going to do? And no burner either. So the, so how many hours did you end up with in the F4? I think I had about uh, 2,500 hours in the F4. And then when you, now, did you always have the same backseater where you kind of crewed up with guys all the time? Um, in combat, yes, we tried to crew up uh, with the same people, but. Um, and we also stood on the hot pad uh, waiting for emergency calls, and then you, you wouldn't necessarily be uh, with the same backseater. Air Force airplanes are flying in the south, in the south, and the Navy's flying in the south. Everybody's flying in the south, but everybody's doing something different. That seems odd, doesn't it? Well, once if you had uh, Navy and Marine uh, planes checking in with the uh, tactical air controller, uh, that was always uh, the Marine Corps in the northern part of uh, Vietnam, in the, what we call the I-Corps. Um, and so they were always under Marine control. Hmm. So what, was a, what will be your longest mission? Longest mission would probably be one hour. So you carried two 370 tanks with you, or? Yes, we had two... Uh, Two tanks, and uh, we'd have a center line uh, multiple ejection rack carry six bombs, and then outboard of the gear we'd have uh, uh, TERS triple ejection racks with carrying three bombs each. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! So you didn't necessarily take off fully fueled then? Uh, we did. Uh, for the most part, we were fully fueled, but um, occasionally you'd take a light load. Yeah. Well, we had a, as a practice in nuclear delivery? Yeah. In the A4? Really? Mm -hmm. That was the, uh, the whole design concept uh, that um, Ed Heinemann drew up the A4 design f to deliver a nuclear bomb. And that's why he had the big, tall uh, uh, landing gear. And uh, it was a single mission, uh, drop the, the bomb and hope that you survived. What was the procedure? What did you do? How did you do it? You do a uh, over-the-shoulder loop uh, delivery and uh, release it at 90 degrees and then get the hell out of Dodge. What was the approach speed? Fast as you could go. That was probably um, in excess of 450 knots. And we, we did our low levels at Fort, you know, in, in Europe. We had Victor Alert, it was called, and with nuclear bombs, where I had six or eight airplanes sitting on alert, you know, guys in the alert shack, and you'd run out. Um, and we, the low levels were flown at 420, and then at IP, you push up to 540. And as you know, the Air 4 goes from 420 to 540, like nothing flat, <laughs> especially in cold weather. Oh, man. Oh. And if you'd, you'd pull the power back, and it would just, the deceleration, because you'd overshoot, you'd go to 600 easy, you know. That was, that was really exciting. I could have done more of that. That would have been fun. Mm -hmm. So, now, you get back to the States after your second tour. Was the second tour a different place? Well, um, <clears throat> I first, uh, let's see, March of 68, I uh, came back, and... Um, I was uh, stationed at El Toro for a couple of months as an interim before going to the Naval Postgraduate School for aer Aeronautical Engineering. And so then after two years at Monterey, came back, Tough assignment there. got, got reassigned uh, F-4s. And so while I was doing that, anticipating going back for my second tour of Vietnam, I uh, went down to the A-4 um, training uh, uh, debt and uh, took the ground school in the A4. Uh, just I knew that uh, we had a lot of A4s over there and so I knew that I could probably fly the two-seat A4 as well as the F4. So in uh, January of 71 I went back to Vietnam and um, I checked into an F4 squadron and uh, they were leaving uh, da Nang to go to uh, Iwakuni, Japan, and so um, 
<clears throat> my flight was to check out the uh, transfer of gas from the tanks so that we could uh, make sure that these airplanes would fly nonstop to uh, Iwakuni. Well, how far, how far is that? Well, that's over a thousand miles, I think. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, while I was doing that, the um, sergeant came down and said, uh, "There's a lieutenant colonel who wants you to check in with the Marine Air Base Squadron." Um, and so I had to go down and uh, sit in front of this colonel, and he said, well, we need a security officer here in Da Nang. And I said, Colonel, I'm uh, in this F-4 squadron, and we're going to Iwakuni. He said, Captain, you don't understand. You got the job. So they took me out of the F-4 squadron. I was the uh, security officer for West Da Nang. Uh, I had a company of Marines guarding the perimeter. And uh, I would do that in the evenings, and during the daytime, I would sneak uh, flights in the TA-4. And uh, one day, I flew three hops in the TA-4, and the colonel said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> okay. So uh, I was uh, flying more than I was uh, paying attention to being the high sheriff of Da Nang. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So let me just add to that that um, in, uh, later in the year, I forget it was about um, July, all of the Marines left Da Nang and went back to Iwakuni or the, the ground um, yeah, to Iwakuni. And uh, so that's when I uh, took all my A4 time and I said, I went to approach to an attack squadron there VMA 311, the Tomcats, and I said, uh, I'd like to join your squadron. So i have been flying the A4 for three or four months. And I said, fine, okay, well, you're the safety officer in our squadron. And I flew then, and I got an MOS in the A4, and was the safety officer in Naval Cooney. So now, so you didn't fly combat in the A4 then? Uh, in the TA-4, I did. The TA-4. And why? I don't. I don't understand the difference. I don't. I don't. The the two seat A-4 TA-4 was used as a uh, high speed uh, tactical air controller around the DMZ, and so we would uh, take up. <coughs> um, we would go to the DMZ and uh, we'd have a, a prick radio in the back seat, and we would direct. Um, the bombers to come in, uh, various targets around the DMZ. <clears throat> so, high, when you mean high speed, what do you mean by high speed? As opposed to an 01 or an 02. Um. So, well, thank you very much for uh, all your words and, and your experience. And uh, I would say you had a great career in the military, wouldn't you? I would. I enjoyed it very much. And I think probably the best part was getting in the reserves for the last four years. I don't know if that's the best part. Uh, I, well, I mean, uh, you're at least in the cockpit. Yes, Because exactly. so many guys, especially the Navy, 11, 12 years, they're usually all done, you know. Yes. And my, I spent 22 years, just same as you, basically, 22 yeah. years, and it was all... Oh, fine. I didn't do anything else. Yeah, so. That's it. Uh, we felt we were more productive flying than trying to fly a desk. Yeah, but it's so often. Can you imagine what it would have been like to go to Washington, D.C.? Oh. Right. <laughs> John Farron did that. He hated it. You know, just carrying tea around or papers around for some general who was carrying papers around for another general. Right. You know, wasting time in meetings all the time. So. Well, anyway, oh, by the way, so now you're an attorney. Are you still practicing? Yes, I am. Wow. I understand some of your clients are dying off lately, though. <laughs> well, after uh, 30 years of uh, preparing wills and trusts, uh, now the...